come on. One, two. Hey, stop, 참 무책임해. 왜 자꾸 들었다 놨다 해. 헷갈리게. 친절은 사양할게. 오해하게 하지 말아요. When I first learned to draw, I was taught the method called the comparative drawing method. And that method was a method of comparison. Some of the basic foundations of drawing include identifying certain locations on the body and the face to begin with. Uh, like for example, from the bridge of your nose to the bottom of your chin, the bridge of the nose to the top of the head is a halfway point. Then from the chin to just below the nose, nose to the eyebrow line, eyebrow line to the hairline is approximately a third. The eye is an eyes width the part. Your pupil aligns with the corner of the mouth. Of course, looking just straight on, a face straight on. Your tear duct approximately aligns with the edge of the nostril. The ear approximately aligns with the eye line. So all these little standards, rules, are something you put within your tool belt and it helps you with drawing as you move forward and you're trying to problem solve and learning to see how to draw. Another rule of thumb is that on the human figure, the area between the torso and the legs, your hip area, is approximately the halfway point on the human body. Another rule of thumb is that your head can be used as a form of measurement and the human body is approximately between seven and a half head heights to eight head heights. Now, of course, human beings are all very unique and we're different in all sorts of ways, but those are just standards for you to remember as you are learning how to draw or trying to hone your skills better. And I think it's also great for us all to continually keep our minds fresh to remember all these key points. Last week, I shared with you more of my classical drawing method. Um, that's a skill set that I've learned probably in the past five years or so. As those resources became more and more available to me online, I was able to study with different people and learn about how the old masters actually drew. But why I myself learned the classical drawing method is because I just wanted more tools in my arsenal to be able to draw as accurately as possible. I feel like the more information that I have, the more I can express my creativity the most. So that's why I like to find out and learn as much as I can. And today I'm going to be sharing with you my um, tools that I use for drawing. And I even promised last week that I was going to share with you how I hand sharpen my pencils. Now that practice is more for the classical drawing method, but it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a zen, relaxing sort of thing too, and I'm going to show you uh, how I do that and talk about it a little bit. And of course we're going to be looking at the sketchbook, the work I've done on my sketchbook challenge for this last week, uh, the 30-60-90 sketchbook challenge, and I am in my last final 10 days of this challenge. <laughs> so ugh, I'm so excited. I'm actually going to tell you I need a break. I need a bit of a break. I'm ready to have a few days where I don't have to draw. <laughs> Although I'm still going to come up with a method of, you know, doing drawing more often. Maybe there'll be a few days a week. So I'm going to think that through. So that's something else that I have on my schedule of things to do. But I'm also excited about the fact that I'm hoping that we're going to get to talk about so many more things since I won't have to be focused on the sketchbook challenge anymore. And just thinking about all the different types of ways that we can take the information that we're gleaning and we're gathering and how we can expand it out so you can express yourself in so many different ways 
with the tools and information that I'm hoping I can share because I do like diversity and creativity. Um, even though at my heart and soul, I'm a draftsman and I love to draw, I love to paint, and I like playing with other concepts and ideas of being creative, not just with um, just actually drawing and painting very accurately, but doing something a little bit more loose. Like this painting right here, I started playing with this a little bit this past week uh, in my slight downtime that I had. Uh, I just started throwing some paint around. I wanted to look like something, but then look a bit abstract. So I don't know if you can tell right now, it's kind of looking like um, water droplets on a pond or something. But still, I wanted to have an abstract look. So it's just a place to play. And so that's why I put that up there. I keep thinking that I need to get a real easel, but I haven't yet because I'm conflicted. Um, a, it would take up so much space and um, then there's the cost. So I don't know if I want to commit to something that I'm not sure about. I've thought about just doing a wall easel where you can mount something on the wall so that you can put something up that way. And I do like um, situations like this where I, all I did was I just took some raw canvas and uh, put it on a piece of gator board and just put it up and that's how I painted on that. So it's kind of hodgepodge, but that's okay. It's cool. <laughs> but in addition, I love doing printing and I love doing stuff on cloth and creative forms of embroidery. I like all kinds of stuff. So let's see what we can get ourselves into. But today, let's talk about just drawing and, uh, and of course the sketchbook challenge. Okay, let's get started. Okay, there is so much to talk about when it comes to drawing tools. These are just my drawing tools. Now I don't use them all the time, um, but this is my collection in general. <laughs> so it seems like a lot. I'm gonna try to go over it quickly because I also wanna show you how I sharpened my pencils because um, I did that last week. And that's how I get these nice edges. Um, so let's just start from the beginning. One of the least expensive things that I like is this Bic mechanical pencil. It's a 0.7 millimeter HB number two. And they are so cheap. I just bought this whole pack um, because I like having these around and in my purse and in my bag that I take out sketching um, on the go. And uh, I just like them a lot because they're very convenient. And it's like, it's less than $7, this whole pack of 24. So I'll try to remember to put the link down below, but if not, it's pretty easy to find. Next, and this is probably more for the classical drawing method, is I really like these Stadler pencils. When I first started doing classical drawing, this was probably the most recommended pencil. Um, but I want to tell you in advance that if you want to try hand sharpening these pencils yourself, I recommend getting a bunch of cheap, inexpensive number two pencils and learning how to do this process on the cheaper pencils first, because what you don't wanna do is buy this expensive set of pencils and break them all and mess them up and ruin that investment. So um, that's my recommendation concerning that pencil. And I will show you at the end, me sharpening that again and just giving some basic instruction on how you do that. But the Stadler is probably my favorite. And so when pencils are too short, what you can do is you can buy these really cool extenders. This is a General's extender and this is a Derwent. Derwent. And uh, so when you think you're not getting as much mileage out of uh, what's left on your pencil, you can use the extender. And the reason why you want the extender is because when you use these pencils, you want to be more of a, a light touch and you typically hold the pencil towards the end and not towards the front like you're used to. You don't do like this. You use it back here. And that's true on the, the regular drawing pencils as well. When you're, when you're using them, you, you, you use it very light. And 
You can get the point nice and sharp so that you can do a really, really fine point on those. And so I'll be talking about that in a bit. But I also have another pencil called Brunzeal. Um, Stephen Bauman likes these pencils uh, in addition to the Stadler. And then I also have some Tombows that I have not tried yet. And then of course we've bought our new um, Faber-Castell pencils that are supposed to have less of a shine to them that I'm going to be testing after this and my Blackwing pencils. So I'm going to be doing that in a bit as well. Another favorite for drawing is uh, using charcoal. And this is a high quality fine art charcoal called Nitrum. It's not very inexpensive, I will say that about it. So if you wanna try using charcoal, uh, you can use inexpensive vine charcoal and that sort of thing before you work up. But this particular types of, but this particular type of charcoal is more for classical drawing. And I have three levels of this. Um, that uh, I bought for the purpose of um, trying to get those values uh, as well as possible. And I think I bought these when I was taking the Juliet Aristides class um, because we were actually drawing in charcoal for that class. So that's what I have for that. And they are also hand sharpened. Um, you can buy this fancy nitrum paddle, which you can tell I haven't used it that much. And for the pencils, I typically use just a cheap piece of sandpaper that's kind of fine. This is P60. I actually just got a pack of these, a small pack of these, at the dollar store. So it was super cheap. But I do have this pack of, um, it's actually more for sharp hand sharpening. They're individual sheets that you can take off of this little cardboard piece. Um, but it's a little curved. And I find it's not great unless I, I hold it a particular way to get the sharpened edge that I want. So that's why I typically use this and it's cheaper. Next, I have this cool little tool that I bought here. This is a large graphite pencil. It's Coronor. Um, and I just, I, I love the feel of it, A. It's so thick and chunky. Let's see if I can get it to focus. There it is. But look at the size of that edge. If you're working on a large area where you're trying to develop a, a deep value in graphite, this is a nice tool. And again, I just love the feel of it. It, looks, it just feels great. <laughs> Another favorite of mine are these um, paper stumps. You can tell I've used this one quite a bit. It just sits in my drawing case. This one is not as used. I don't know if it's as good a quality. And this is just a compressed version of that, a one made in Taiwan. I think I just got this off of Amazon. But that's typically what they look like. But I like this one the best, probably. And you can technically unroll these um, so you get a cleaner edge as you go. Um, but it's great because when you're working on values or you're just trying to touch up a small detail, you can actually, once they get enough graphite on it, you can lightly draw with it if you're just doing a very small area and just trying to get a little bit of a, a, a light value in there. So that's kind of cool uh, about these. And you avoid using your fingers. As I mentioned before, if you saw that video, you typically when you're drawing with especially graphite is you don't want to rub with your finger because the oil in your skin can get on the paper and it will cause the graphite to start sticking. So that will possibly ruin your efforts, maybe ruin your drawing and that prevents that. And you can also use a piece of paper towel, just cut yourself off a little piece or tear off a little piece and use that as a way to rub and smooth out uh, a graphite area that you're working on. Other fun tools to have in your pack is things like pastel pencils. This is a General's charcoal pencil. Other pencils like Prismacolor, um, a charcoal drawing pencil. This is a Conte uh, pencil that uh, is of a particular color. I think it's like a sepia color. And that's kind of nice when you're trying to do something different. 
Of course, I always have my knitting needles, especially the small knitting needles that fit into my drawing pack. They're really great for measuring and comparing things. You can also use your pencil, and I often do, but when it's something's really fine and my pencil's too large to use for a measurement tool, I, I like these. And then I always have microns around. I like the O3 and the O1, all the variations of the micron because you never know when you might need to outline something and it's permanent and it's very handy. Another cool thing that I have is these um, very fine erasers. They tend to last a long time. They're refillable. So the little small one is called Mono Zero. And um, then this one is called Tough Stuff Eraser Stick. And they're very handy when you're trying to get something very small. Hopefully it will focus, focus. There we go. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're pretty great. Pretty great little tools to get fine areas cleaned up and then you can actually clean or cut the end of the, of the eraser off if you need to, or just rub it on a piece of paper just to clean it. And this is what the mono looks like in its package. It's actually, I think, made in Japan. Yeah, it's Japanese. Then another thing that's a must is kneading erasers. This is a standard that you must have in your drawing pack. Um, typically, I like General's kneaded erasers. Not the Faber-Castell, they just feel different. I, I have two little packs of these and when I tried them, it just does not have the same feel as the General's kneaded eraser. It's my favorite, but they're not cheap, surprisingly. It's not very cheap. But the way you use kneaded erasers is that when it gets dirty, sorry, I'm zooming in and out here. Um, you just pull it like this. And these things last a long time. And sometimes I will put them in plastic bags and have them so they stay as clean as possible. Or I just have one over here by my desk. And you clean it by just by pulling it like that. And then you get a whole new area that's um, not so dirty and it's nice to clean up a, a large area like that or if you're trying to do a really fine drawing and getting all your values just perfect you can form it to a very 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 tippy point like this and just lightly pick at your drawing to get little specks out so super handy another eraser that i usually have is something like this little mono eraser just helps you to have good erasers. I typically like white erasers. Um, you can have the pink eraser. There's a pink, I think it's called a pink lady. I think I have one somewhere around, but I tend to use them very little. And I don't like anything that's possibly gonna compromise or color my, my paper if I'm rubbing it, because uh, I've had that happen before. So that's why I lean that way. Another really handy tool that I have around is this proportional um grid but it's a red color which what it does is it cancels out color and helps you see values when you're trying to work on a drawing and getting those values correct so pretty handy little tool now on to paper so i would say that this is my standard go-to drawing paper when i'm just plain or sketching i have other brands that are cheaper but if you're actually maybe trying to work on something nice. This 400 series of the Strathmore sketched paper is pretty good. Often when we have classes, this is what we use. It's just fine enough for a good drawing. Now this is not something you would paint in. They do have mixed media pads as well. And I, I tend to like the Strathmore product quite a bit. However, if you're trying to do something very fine and you've advanced your skills and you're ready to get onto some really high quality paper, this company called Legion makes um, a pad of paper called Stonehenge. This one has slight variations of colors, um, very light variations of colors. And then I have a white pad as well. And so a lot of my 
higher quality studies, my um, bar plate studies, that sort of thing, typically are done on this type of paper. Of course, as you advance into paper, you know, you can get all sorts of variations. Hot pressed, cold pressed. My favorite for drawing is hot pressed. This is Arches hot pressed paper. It's very fine. And um, it's just uh, it's just a nice surface to, to draw on. And then there's Arches cold press. Um, this is a very thick pound. This is 140 pound. Um, this is great for printmaking and um, drawing things, or I think you could even do some watercolor on here because it's thick enough to do that on. Lots of variations, but what you can do if you're interested in paper is visit different companies' websites like Arches and I think Fabriano, lots of different companies available. And sometimes they will sell you samples. Um, it might be a small pack or they might give you a freebie. Um, just check what's out there and what's nice when you get the pack, you can play with them and see what papers that you might like. But when I first started taking drawing classes um, in the classical method, I got the opportunity to take a class with um, the artist Scott Waddell, who went to the Florence Academy of Art. And I think once I started practicing classical drawing methods, even though I may not tend to want to draw like this all the time, I think that this is when I started seeing my drawing skills really change and evolve. And so this was a, a drawing that I worked on in that class. And here he was doing some sketches, explaining how values work, showing a sphere and how uh, the light affects and the value affects uh, the observation of something actually looking like it's a 3D object. So since then I've taken other classes uh, where you know I learned how to really work on my grayscales in, in great detail. And uh, this is an example of one that I worked on. Um, I'm gonna turn it upside down because I think it makes more sense that it's upside down. I think the reference I had had it working from dark to light, but working from light to dark, you just use three different pencils, use the 2H, the H, and the HB, and uh, you go from light to dark, and you practice how gently you can uh, have those values uh, slowly graduate up and getting to the darker and darker into the very darkest, so. I'll turn that back around so you can see it in this form. And so that's just a, a skill set that you work on. Another skill is starting to work on those spheres that I mentioned. And this is a method where you actually start off uh, learning how to draw a sphere very accurately, not just randomly or using a, a cheating object like some type of a jar or something like that or a piece of plastic that helps you draw circles because you don't know what size you might need for a circle to be drawn. So this was just uh, something, but sometimes people find this very arduous uh, skill to learn. And uh, I studied this with, um, I did, took some online classes with Sadie Valeri, um, which it can be a, a bit of a difficult program. I technically don't even know if she still has those classes available. Um, and then we went into doing ellipses and like I said, it can become arduous. And so because I have a bit of a playful nature about me, I had to illustrate, uh, yeah, a cow being abducted by aliens. That was the way that I decided I would make this a fun exercise learning how to make these ellipses smaller and smaller and perfect. And then, yeah, and then the cow got abducted. That's what happened. <laughs> Another thing that uh, we did in that class and that I have gone on to practice, I do this often on my own, is where you make a sphere and you practice your values um, very gently. And maybe sometime if you're interested, I will show you how to do this. It's the way that you learn how light works on an object, how it has reflected light um, and the lightest point and how it affects the area around it and how the areas around it will affect the object itself. So this is a really great tool. 
And this is another version of me working on how to construct that sphere and practicing the hardnesses of my pencils that I was working on. So that's what all this set of uh, tools are. And I taught this for a while in 2019 and uh, it's not for everybody, but if you wanna take the time to really improve your skills, these are really great methods. So there's that. Okay, now I'm going to put all this aside and we're going to actually test our pencils. Okay, for testing these pencils. Um, these are already sharpened, so I'm not going to take the time to um, sharpen them or hand sharpen them. I'm gonna use them as they are. And like I said before, if you watched the other video, I just got this small set. Because I had watched somebody and they said that you did not need uh, the larger set. So that's what we are going to be uh, doing. So starting from the 2B, 4B, 6B, 8B, 10B, 12B. And uh, let's just take a look and see how well these do. And then compare it to this black wing that I have. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just go from light to dark. And hopefully you can see this well enough. Ooh, it feels very smooth, I will say that. See how I'm holding a little bit further towards the back? You can even, like when you're doing a classical drawing, you would actually be all the way back here at points, depending how on how fine you want it to be. Let's see if I can get it a little darker. Because usually where you get a glare buildup is when the graphite starts building up and getting darker and darker until it almost starts um, causing like a mirror-like surface. So I'm gonna try and see if I can duplicate that in this little spot here. I will say overall, it's pretty matte. It's pretty, pretty nice. So let's compare that actually to a Stadler uh, HB. Oh, the Stadler still feels so good. Might be a little more scratchy sounding. I'm doing HB because technically I could not find a 2B. But it shouldn't be much of a problem. So yeah, already I'm seeing you can see as I hold this to the window, see the shine on the traditional graphite pencil building up? And that's just with a little bit of time spent on that. Look at the shine compared to the absence of shine in this pencil. So that's really nice. So let's try the other colors really quickly. And I might just fast forward through this so this doesn't get too long. Okay, looking at this on an angle, it's looking really nice, especially comparing that graphite on this bottom here. All those grays are actually pretty nice. As you move to the darkest, the 12B, you might start to get a little bit of a sheen to it, but I actually like it. And I think if I was gonna do a portrait in, char in graphite, I would probably use this pencil, to be honest with you, to avoid that. Sometimes I like the shine and sometimes I don't. And I think in portraits are probably when I like it the least. So the only question is, can you buy these individually? Because with a Stadler, you can buy the pencils that you use the most in a box, like I have here. Um, individually to replace as you go versus having to buy another set. And I don't know if they have that or if it's cost effective or whatnot, but I really like that in comparison. 
but let me try my black wing set here. I only have one level of black wing. I only have this one, I only have this one brand of black wing, which is a soft, so it doesn't even tell you on this box whether it's an HB or 2B or anything, so I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how where they work in comparison. It's very soft, I will say that. I'm going to do a longer line of it just to compare the glare. It's very soft, this, this particular pencil itself. Let's see, make sure I'm pressing really hard to get that darker value over here just for the purpose of sampling. So see that is still more like traditional graphite. So I don't know, I know there is some specific black wing pencils that are, they have clay in it and it's supposed to make it where it is also more of a matte. So this particular box is not comparative. I would have to get the other box. Um, but overall, I really uh, like these Faber-Castell Pit Graphite Matte Pencils. So I hope that you found that helpful. I, I certainly did. Yeah, I like it. Nice. Now on to hand sharpening. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. So this is typically the type of blade that I get. It's very uh, narrow, it's not the big chunky ones, it's just the right size for me personally. This is a messy process, so you might wanna make sure that you have a piece of paper underneath. And like I said, start with a cheap pencil for practicing this and be very, very, very careful. So when you do this, you wanna make sure you're just sliding that blade. You slide it right along. And the way you do that is I use a two-handed method where I'm sliding and gliding. I'm not doing it right now, but sliding carefully and gliding right along the edge. Don't put too much pressure. You have to learn how to do this. And as you go, you slowly rotate, slowly carving off pieces of that pencil until you get a nice tip. And this is kind of a nice standard rule. You want a nice piece of the graphite showing and then a tapered edge. This is what professionally is the standard for a hand sharpened pencil to look like. I've seen people do it where it just looks like, I don't know, a, a rat's been gnawing on it. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't particularly want anybody to do that because I think if you gouge your way into a pencil, A, you have more of a likelihood of hurting yourself. And second of all, you're just not gonna get a, a good product. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of picky about it. And like I said, you wanna be safe. That's the biggest thing. So just make sure that you're just gliding as you go. So I can show you like when you go back over pencil and you're just trying to redo it, you just slowly, and you get a feel for it as you go. We're just slowly, small slivers, Turn as you go. And just get a feel for how that works. And the more you gouge it, the more difficult it will be to do this. So that's why you want to make sure that you start doing it right and in your practice that you get this method down just right so that you end up with a nice looking tool. So that's how, that's how you do it when you're just trying to sharpen. And this is just the beginning, right? You're just trying to get that tapered edge first. And this is already looking pretty good. So a couple spots I wanna correct here. And then I might just do this as well, just kind of like glide it along and turn and rotate again, just getting that graphite down a little bit. Then you wanna go to your, your sandpaper. 
And like I said, I like having small pieces like this and I hold it where it's slightly elevated in the middle and, and I rotate it as I go. Trying to get that edge nice and sharp and tapered. Be very careful not to break your, your graphite. Again, this is all about practice. And so that's how that works. So, now, starting with a brand new pencil. Don't be intimidated. Again, make sure you're practicing cheap pencils first. So we're just gonna slowly start working on that edge. And I'm actually gonna probably speed up part of this because it's gonna get really boring. Because this is not a fast method, to be honest with you. You can use a standard pencil sharpener, um, but this is just standard practice for classical drawing. It's what they teach you in the ateliers. And you see how what I'm doing is while I'm holding this, I'm pushing with this thumb here. I push it and uses a way to glide it. See that I can show you this. To glide it right along the edge, slowly taking off bits and pieces. And so that wider edge allows you to do a variation of values on your paper and allows you to get a super sharp point. And as I'm going, I'm turning. And it's not gonna be perfect. Sometimes you're going to do some gouges, but the trick is to train yourself to not do this. This is like whittling or something. I feel like that one was a bit of a gougey piece that I took up there. I also feel like this is kind of like a Zen practice in a way. It's very meditative. Typically I'm not chattering away while I do this. And slowly we work it away until I start to get a more of a tapered edge. And then eventually I will see the graphite. Of course, typically I would be down here holding my pencil right over my paper. And I probably would usually have a larger piece of paper, but I just grab something quick. is exposed. Start working on my sanding. Turning as I go. I'm not just doing the point, I'm doing the edge to taper it to the very, very end. Let's see if that thing will show. So you can see how it's slowly being tapered. And for the, f for the most part, my carving's fairly good. I see a couple of inconsistencies that I'd rather fix, but you don't have to. It's all about personal preference. This is just a ritual for doing something that you really care about and you want to provide yourself with the tools to do the, the best quality work that you can. And so once it's done, you, uh, you're you ready to start. Okay, so into the sketchbook. And just so you know, Scooby's right over there. He's being a little ornery, my bird Scooby. And uh, so he's wanting to be heard today. <laughs> so you will be hearing him most likely. Um, 
This is what we worked on last week, or I worked on last week for number 72 out of the 90 day challenge. And then I did a simple avocado. And that's what it looks like up close and personal. So I started with the lighter shade of green and then started working in all my darker colors, the shadows. Um, then going back, it's a, it's a layering process where darker greens are added, preserving the highlight for the most part. And then the final touches were um, the highlights using a little bit of gouache and then the details on the little stem piece and all that sort of thing. So that's what I worked on that day. And so this is another horrible moment in my sketchbook. Well, my judgment, of course, my, my analysis of my own work. Um, the drawing started out pretty good. So this is a copy of an Ingress uh, study, a piece of famous artist. If you've never heard of, I, I, and I, to be honest with you, his name's a little perplexing. I think it's French and it looks like Angres, but it's, I've heard people call it Ang, so I'm not sure technically how to pronounce his name, but I have a book on him and this was a study in that book and uh, it's not worth even comparing. <laughs> My mind, I don't want to embarrass myself any further. I did love the drawing, so I think I'd be interested in going back and trying this again, maybe. Um, in another study, maybe in an oil, actual oil study. Then I moved on to just a landscape. And this landscape is actually um, a photograph reference that I had from before. So we have properties owned by our local government near me. And this was an area where they did a prescribed burn. So prescribed burning is a land management method to maintain the undergrowth uh, in a forest area so that it prevents bigger wildfires from occurring. A whole team, uh, a crew of people that have been certified go out and light the fires. Usually it's, it's kind of secluded to a smaller area and they just basically burn out the underbrush. And this tree it was, um, I photographed this tree after one of the prescribed burns. And what you will see is like the bottom part of the pine was all like dark and um, charred from the fire. And the top part was its lighter color. And I really love that. And you can see how like even there's still growth. So it doesn't kill off the larger trees. It only kills off smaller trees and invasive species and dried grass and all the uh, detritus and uh, undergrowth that has been building up. And that makes it where if a fire does break out, um, they can maintain it a lot easier and preserve that ecosystem. So there's a lot less damage. Um, but what's great about these fires, technically, what a lot of people don't realize is that because the fire happens, all of a sudden all the um, nitrogen and uh, the chemicals um, in the plants get released into the ground and that causes like a rebirth. Um, it's almost like putting fertilizer on the ground. All of a sudden all these flowers will start blooming and it gives space more for the animals that live in the area. So it's it's really has so many positive, positive aspects. So, and I don't know if you know this, but the state of Florida has actually been coined as being one of the capitals of the world for lightning strikes. And as a result, the ecosystems, the, the different plant areas uh, that we have here, a lot of the plants have evolved to rely on fires to thrive. In fact, we have a sand pine here that its pine cones do not release its seeds until a fire has occurred. So it's quite unique, but I really love this picture and it just kind of shows you the life and death cycle of, of nature. And so, and I, I think this practice is very healthy. Then another thing that we did, or I did, was, I keep saying we, is I did this window from a reference. I found this old house somewhere up north, maybe in Georgia, I think, um, where this house was just abandoned, dilapidated, falling apart. 
And this window technically has panes that were cracked out. Um, some panes still existed. And this vine, this uh, vine called Smilex, uh, had climbed up all on top of the house and hanging on to the rotting wood and into the house itself. And I just thought it was really a unique, pretty little picture. So I, I did that one quickly. But you see, I, what I did was to define that these panes were actually broken was that I made those areas really strongly black. And then the panes that still existed, I kind of made them look smoky and added a little bit of grays and blues to create the perception of a reflected light that glass typically has. Then I went on and did a barn, which I thought was a good compliment to this, but this was just something I found on Google. It's okay, I felt like it could have been a lot better because I, this is also like a, a barn or a structure that's really falling apart and I don't feel like I really captured it there, but all in all for a Google Street View, I think it turned out pretty good. I can't remember where I found this reference. I did tweak it a little bit um, and then I just wanted to show how you could create the concept or perception of mist by using light washes. I started off with an overall very light wash with a little bit of gray and blue. And uh, of course I kind of sketched out where I wanted things to be. And I kept it very wet the whole time. Um, even when I did the tree itself, my first pass was very wet. It was kind of bleeding all over the place, but that's what I wanted it to do. I wanted it to have almost a smoky kind of a look to it. And then even the trees were variations of washes that I did, wanting these trees back here to look very receded and into the background. These to be slightly closer. This tree is slightly lighter, or this tree is slightly darker. And then this tree being at the forefront, the main focus of this whole image, it is the darkest tree in the group. So now I will say about the next image, it does not fit into everything else I've done, but I wanted to do it. It's a Google Street View image of a place in Korea. This is one of the palaces. And I mean, it might look okay on camera, but I wasn't very happy with it to show it on Instagram. I showed it in my stories but it didn't seem to be cohesive to fit into my actual feed, so I didn't load it there. I don't dislike it, it but it almost looks more like an urban sketch. It's very loose, and that's what I wanted to do because I really didn't have time for all the detail that was technically in it. But what I love about these trees, so in Korea they have this particular pine. It's I think it's their national tree, to be honest with you. Um, and it almost kind of reminds me of that tree in the prescribed burn because the colors in the trees there are so strikingly clay colored with variations of darks and they're really beautiful but they often are very windy like this which locally kind of makes me think of our turkey oaks but our turkey oaks are short where these pine trees are actually quite tall so um, there's something I'm kind of interested in and I hope that the next time I go back that I can capture that and um, do some studies of them, maybe in a little bit more detail. And that was set number 79 in my 90 days. And now I get into my final 10 days in my sketchbook. Can you believe it? <laughs> I'm here, but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to fit it all into this one sketchbook. So I'm going to have to do some problem solving to figure out where I want to put my final uh, images, maybe in back in one of the other journals that I started in, uh, maybe the one that I wasn't as happy about. So we will see. I may preserve these past few, these last few pages for the images that I think would fit best in this particular journal, and we will see. We will see, but being that it is 10 days, so technically I have from starting today all the way through next week, um, I have that whole week and then that weekend and then a couple of days, I think I finish on Tuesday. I think that's right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold off 
and giving you an update for those final 10 days to one video. So I don't know if I'm going to skip next weekend and publish maybe the middle of the week so that I can share the sketchbook or if I'll just publish something short um, like a process video or something like that. I'm not quite sure. I gotta figure that out. But I think it would be best to have all 10 final days done versus showing you my last week being, oh, here's what I did for the past like three days or whatever. Anyway, so that's my current plan and we will see how it goes. Okay guys, I am going to end the video right here. Um, Scooby's done for the day and uh, we've made a mess in the, in, the, in the studio. So it's time to wrap up and uh, I gotta clean up clearly. But I hope that this video isn't too long. We'll see in the editing process where we go, but I wanna provide you with as much information as possible and I hope that you found it helpful, inspiring, and uh, I also wish you well. I hope you have a beautiful and blessed creative week ahead and have fun. Annyeong! In Korean, goodbye. Bye! Annyeong! Bye, Scooby. Say goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.